Well, thank you for coming. Uh, I've got, just I thought it was interesting. Uh, uh, I was thinking about this and I wanted to say a few things about this. Uh, and it, it, I think it pertains to our culture. I, point number one, the elite versus the middle class. It's a biblical principle. Uh, next, the postmodern culture number two. Uh, when, when it, things kick in, it's going to quickly consume Christianity like, like wheat, a dry wheat field. Right now it's like, you talk to people, it's like, well, it's, it's, you know, it's coming, it's not going to happen soon. It's like, no, when, when, it, when it starts to burn, the, the, it's, it's been simmering and people are trying to light the fire. But when this thing starts to burn, Christianity is not itself old and dead, but it's, it's seen as an old, dead, out of date. It's, it's gone. It, it's gone. Now, it may morph into something else, but true Christianity, and I'll, I'll, I want to talk about that. And the point, third point I want to mention tonight is, is there's, there's no temporal defense for the Christians. You may want to write this down. I, I didn't think about it until I was driving over here. Right there, I've got three verses, Habakkuk, Daniel, and then write down a Revelation 13.7. I'll look at that verse also. So that should go on your notes, Revelation 13.7. There is a time in history, as time is going, that say this is history as a whole, and the grand picture is God is going to bring the day of the Lord and bring deliverance. Ta-da! God is good. But as you look through history, there are times where there is no deliverance. We just crash and burn. It's like, what do you mean? I mean we crash and burn. It's like there's, there's the crucifixion. Jesus died. Well, he was resurrected, right? Because his events came three days apart. He crashed and burned and was resurrected. We will crash and burn and be resurrected. His just happened here, where he was resurrected. We will be, I mean, you've got, the, you've got the Jews, for example, in Egypt. You've got uh, the Jews in Babylon. You've got the Maccabees. You've got the prophecies of Daniel. You've got the, the uh, 64 A.D. Christians. You've got the Christians of Revelation. And there is no deliverance. So as these things go, we, we need to understand that, that there may not be deliverance that, you know, that we would hope. It's like you may have to pay the price. And the third, fourth thing, uh, the failures and disasters that are, as this chaos sets in as this as this 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 I'll just say chaos I just want chaos as chaos sets in and, and negative things happen as they as the world collapses because of their un, their disconnection with reality they're going to blame the Christians. They're going to blame these it's their fault. It's their fault. They won't be able to understand it. And so those are some things I, I think we should get ready for, at least be aware of. And so here we go. Uh, I, I've got these verses written out. We've been going through the minor prophets, and so it's something you've heard. But now we're going to just make the point right here that to set up the fourth generation, between going from the third generation, the generation of arrogance and pride, of we've got a better way, they're creating their own reality, the arrogant generation, they give way to the fourth generation. It's not a giving way. It's not like they're handing off the baton, finish it up. It's taken by force from the third generation. Just like all the kings of the earth, it's taken by force. There's rulers, there's, there's domination, do dominion. That's what takes place in this whole thing. And the fourth generation is going to take it, and they're going to oppress the poor. They're going to devour the poor and needy from the earth. And what is happening here, those that establish this re new reality... They're part in that reality. If you're going to create a reality, you're going to be at the top of that reality. You're going to become the elite. You're going to become the ruling class. You're going to become the nobility. You're going to be the ones that take over. In the process of taking over, once you have that power, now, if you did not have a normal human nature, or if you were a Christian elite, with a moral, I mean, I'm not talking about Christian in, in, in history, but a Christian, a biblical Christian, you would realize your responsibility like an apostle like Paul. I, he says, I've got rights, but he says, I'm not going to use my rights because I'm more interested in you as a leader. You're more interested in helping the people than, you know, 
entrenching yourself in your power. Even Christians, Christian leaders struggle with that. Now imagine you have no values. Imagine you have no morals and you are living just for today. today it's now or never. Uh, and that goes back to your worldview. If, if you are an, an, a leader, a Christian leader, you're looking, put, I mean, in, in, in a pure sense, you're looking at your position in time as itself being temporary, and you're even, as, if you're the leader, if you're the king of the world today, if you're, if you're a, a, a Constantine, if you're a Charlemagne, you're looking, I'm the leader, I'm on top of the stack, but you realize this is a big game. This is not just a 70-year game, uh, and I'm dealing with people that are going to live for 70 years. I am a person under a greater kingdom that's eternal, and these people that I'm ruling are eternal. So if you see this as a, uh, as a secularist, you've got one lifetime, and the people you're ruling have one lifetime. I mean, it's one and done. And so there's no, there's, there's no barrier. There's no, no, uh, uh, nothing countering your sin nature of you get on the top and use these people like cattle. A Christian would see, see, see it differently, hopefully, although you still have to deal with the sin nature. This fourth generation will devour the poor and needy. The elite, as they gain power, will take the middle class and they will drive them into the ground. They'll drive them into poverty. Jesus says you'll, you'll have the poor with you always. There's always going to be poor. It's part of the world system. It's not because God created the poor and wants poor people. It's just that the world, as, as in this age, on this side of history, we're always going to have poor people. Uh, for a variety of reasons. It, it can be health. It can be mental conditions. It can be the family they were born into. It can be choices. It can be, it, it can be what, the, what part of the city they come from and what the, the resources are, their education. It's like, it's just what's, there's, we're all just one step from becoming poor if it be our health, if it be our mental condition, if it be our job, if it be uh, your inheritance, if it be someone in your family getting sick, whatever. We're just one step. And so you're never going to get rid of all the poor. We're talking about something else here. We're talking about the middle class that have jobs. They have health. They have intelligence. They have businesses. They, they use their opportunities. And all of a sudden, someone starts taking those opportunities away from them. They, they take their inheritance. They take their property. They, they, they buy their businesses or they take their businesses uh, they begin to oppress them, taking away their fields. They can't make a living. And now they go into poverty because it's like everything was fine, but I was oppressed. You can be oppressed by a situation that makes you, what we'd say, the poor, but the middle class can be driven into poverty. And when it talks about the fourth generation that will destroy, devour the poor and needy from the earth, that would include the poor, but it would also include what formerly had been the middle class. And here's your verses. And you can see, I mean, we're talking Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, uh, Amos. And again, this is just, I just grabbed some verses. Uh, and I won't be able to set all of the verses up. But Jeremiah 22, speaking to Jehoiakim, this king, right here, Jehoiakim. He's the one, after Jehoahaz came, Jehoiakim. He's the one that should have done much better than he did. He rebelled against that Nebuchadnezzar. The one that set all these up. Speaking to Jehoiakim. You have eyes and a heart only for your dishonest gain, for shedding innocent blood, and for practicing oppression and violence. That was after Jehoahaz had been taken to Egypt by the Pharaoh Necho, and Nebuchadnezzar had set Jehoiakim on the throne, and this is during Nebuchadnezzar's time. So Jehoiakim is not oppressing the Egyptians, they're oppressing him. It's not Nebuchadnezzar. He's not oppressing the Babylonians. There, the, that Babylonians put him in power. Who's Jehoiakim oppressing? As a leader, as the elite, he knows nothing more than to oppress his own people. And there it is. You can see dishonest gain, shedding blood, practicing oppression and violence. There's your word, Hamas. Social unju injustice, social oppression. Isaiah 5 8. Woe to those who join house to house who add field to field until there's no more room, and you are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. In other words, that's the elite 
And once they start rolling, and it's the basic, the rich get richer. Now there's nothing wrong with taking and, and expanding your business. There's nothing wrong with, you know, uh, getting more fields. You got field there. I mean, there's nothing wrong with expanding. It's a whole idea of the middle class growing and expanding. But what we're talking about here is someone who is gobbling it up. What are those who join house to house, who add field to field? I mean, this is the idea not of someone that is expanding their business, but someone who is gobbling up the market. Uh, you say a monopoly. How, how long do they do this? Until there is no more room and you are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. In other words, there's no, you have no opportunities. You, if there's a middle class, everyone would have a chance. Or, as, and again, we're not talking about America here. We're talking about the way God set up Israel. They had land for the family, the inheritance. Here, they're talking about buying up inheritance and take what well, we continue. Hosea 4, 1 through 3. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithless or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Once again, that lying and murder, that's, again, the elite coming in and taking away the things, making covenants and breaking covenants. Micah 2.2, 2. we got a couple verses in Micah. They covet fields and seize them, houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Now, again, I've said this before, but that is not talking about the poor. That's talking about people that have houses and fields and property, and they're taking it. They're taking it from the poor. They're poor because they don't have anything. That's what the church, that's what Christians, that's what good citizens do. They support the poor. They can't take care of themselves. You help take care of the poor. That's another whole story. These are people that have a house. They have a business. They have an inheritance. They have a field, but no longer. They've been, they've been made poor, not because of their mental state, not because of an addiction, not because of bad luck. They've been made poor because of oppression. And then here's the example. All right, oppress a man in his house and a man in his inheritance. And then here's right, right in the same time period, uh, 1 Kings 21.1. Sometime later, Naboth the Jezreelite happened to own a vineyard in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And you know that story. Ahab wanted to buy it. And they couldn't buy it because he wouldn't sell it. Naboth wouldn't sell it. And so Jezebel says, well, I'll take care of it. So she hires some men, some scoundrels that will work for her, some, some uh, rioters, some uh, Antifa. And they went down to the courts and they lied about Naboth, said he cursed the king, he cursed God. Really, notice they bring in God. They bring, he cursed God. Oh, these are the religious people. They're using the name of God to bring Naboth, Naboth down. And so Naboth then got accused and stoned to death, and Jezebel came home to tell Ahab, hey, it's for sale. And he bought it. He joined land to land, field to field, house to house. Micah 2, 8 through 9. Lately my people have risen up as an enemy. You strip the rich robe from those who pass by trustingly with no thought of war. Now, he's not, they're not stealing the rich robe from the poor. They're stealing the rich robe from those who are prospering and trusting that everyone's going to be honest and follow the laws of the land. The women of my people you drive out from their delightful houses. These are not street people. These are middle class women who have houses that are driven out of their delightful houses. They may be inherited them. They may be worked for them. They may be taken care of them. From their young children, you take away my splendor forever. In other words, the inheritance of the family, my, they, they, they don't have it. Micah 3, 9 through 11. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who detest <coughs> justice. They detest justice. Someone's coming down with, we got a case, we got justice. Someone's been found guilty. Someone's been accused of a crime. The evidence is there. We don't want, we detest justice. We want our reality. We want our way. We are the elite. We don't want justice. We want what we want. We detest justice. The only way you're going to work in our advantage is if we get what we want. The elite class is growing, and the middle class, they have nowhere to go. Now, again, I'm not saying this is, this is Bible history. This is what we see in Israel. But this is the way of mankind. And once this cycle sets in, what we see historically is 
if this again is your timeline of history, and here's this decline coming. God doesn't like, oh no, jump off his throne, come down in here and rescue it, and bring judgment to these people. Sometimes it takes 40 years. Sometimes it takes a, a, a period of time. Sometimes it, it, it's, it's going to take the collapse of the entire nation. We're ultimately waiting for Jesus to return. And so in other words, if this starts to happen in your culture, you can find strength in the Lord. In other words, what I'm saying is you need to find strength in the Lord. And Tony and I have been talking about this. It's like we realize we need to develop this relationship with the Lord. I mean, it's like, oh, I thought you did. Well, we did at, at, at this middle class level. I have never developed a relationship with the Lord in a, in, well, you know, I've been oppressed. I didn't like my job. I didn't have enough money. Had to work an extra job. Or, you know, I had hard times. You know, I got sick. Uh, but I've never been in this place where I was in a state of oppression in a society where I had to trust the Lord knowing that I was not going to see deliverance on this side of history. That, and this, that there, it's not going to happen. I mean, it's not like, are you being negative? Okay, okay. But then you need to. There's there's a there's a live nativity scene down the road. You should probably go see, and uh, hook up with that reality, and, uh, and 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 live happily ever after until you can't figure this out. Um, uh, we got Amos. Oh yeah, well, yeah. I could do this. Amos chapter two, verse six through eight. For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth, and turn aside the way of the afflicted. A man and his father go to the same girl, so that by holy name is profaned, they lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge, and in the house of their God they drink wine of those who have been fined. In other words, they're taking the garments and the wine of the middle class, that they're not paying them back, they're using it for their own sake. We've talked about that in Amos in detail. Hear this, who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain? In other words, as they're bringing this oppression, they're, they are not interested in justice. They're bringing oppression. They're interested in uh, when, when can we make more money? When can we make more money and bring more oppression? It's like they don't, they're not even aware or concerned with what's taking place down here. And that's normal if you think you're only going to live 70 years and these people are just a mere commodity of the nation, a 70-year lifespan. We'll use it now. If you realize there's a kingdom over you and you're going to live forever in a forever kingdom and these people are, are subjects of a greater kingdom than yours, uh, you would treat them differently. Nonetheless, what we are seeing potentially in our time matches exactly with the third into the fourth generation is an elite class rising, and they don't care. They can't care. They don't understand. And there's nothing you can... It's like, we'll take it to court. You can't take it to court. I will reason with them. You can't reason with them. The only thing you can do is cooperate with them, and you should have been planning ahead and getting a piece of the action in the elite, like maybe a Senate seat or something so that you could play along. It's too late. They're all gone. The, the, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I never even thought that I, I should have been... I always thought about investing money. I always thought about having a career, uh, of, of planning for the future, having a retirement set up. That's why I'm working four more years, so I secure my full IPERS. Uh, I never thought what I should do is that when oppression sets in, I need to be in a position where I can oppress and not be oppressed. And then, I mean, how foolish of me. I was thinking I should invest more money, and I didn't invest enough money. I, 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 I had six kids. I should have had six kids. I should have not, maybe I even got married and just kept putting money in the bank, and I could, I could be retired right now and traveling. No, I couldn't. I would be in lockdown somewhere. Uh, good thing we traveled and had kids, but nonetheless. <laughs> so, I mean, these are the, this is what I think we're seeing. You've got to at least consider it. Uh, this is the way of human nature. And it is possibly the way of, of your society. Now, this next part is the, this postmodern culture. Uh, that's what I'm calling it. Uh, and you can identify it in a variety of ways. But it comes where you, you, you've completely gone into secularism, but you've gone past secularism where you're actually now, uh, you've rejected the ultimate truth 
and you've gone to look at science and you're going to measure everything and find out what's in nature, but this has now gone to the place now where it's inside your, we'll just say, heart. It's inside your heart. It's your own feelings. Your, your authority is not God. Your authority is not reality, because reality, I mean, people don't like the light, John says, because they are dark. There's darkness in their heart. And so the light, they reject the light. They run from the light. Well, now science. science. We can maybe use science and find that. But as they look into science, guess what science is going to shine? It's going to shine light. It's going to shine truth. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, this doesn't, we don't want this either. And they're going to have to shut off, seriously, they're going to have to shut off science. They're going to have to shut off facts. They're going to have to shut off things that they want to call it data. They're going to have to change it, update it, look at it from a different direction. Because the only place they're going to be comfortable with their darkness is in a place of darkness, which is their dark, fallen heart. And now we can create our own reality, which is what the tree of knowledge of good and evil was all about. God says, don't go over there. Satan says, you can go over here and be just like God. You can make your own reality. Sounds appealing. But to do that, we're finding out you've got to shut off the truth of, of God's revelation. You've got to have to change the reality so that you can feel comfortable. And that is what we have here, the postmodern age. Now understand, when we start taking down the things that are what we'd say cultural, we're going to start taking down history. We're going to start taking down all the things, because remember, any problems are going to be, because over here in your heart, in your reality that you've created, everything would fit. Everything would be fine because I want this, I think this, these are the things that I want. Now, if there's anything outside that's causing confusion here, it's got to be this problem over. It's someone else's fault. This is perfect because it all makes sense to me. You're, 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 you're oppressing me. You don't understand me. And so culture who rejects your, your stupid little opinion is oppressive. We've got to change that. History, which says this will never work. We need to change that. Science that says that's not factual. You can't even survive in that condition. And in this list of things is going to be this thing called Christianity. Now, when I say Christianity, I mean historical Christianity, biblical Christianity. The book of Revelation, I think, can reduce it to Jesus and the Word. The Son of God and the revelation of Him. These two things. These two things in the face of a culture that's not just one. Now, listen, if there's just one person like that, you can all look at them, get them counseling, help them along, be a light to them. But when you've got an entire culture like this, and they're looking at you, you understand you're the one that's going to need to get counsel. You're the one that's going to need to get help. You're the one that has the problem. When, when you've got some kind of a culture, some kind of a history, you've got science, you've got the truth of God's revelation, and you see someone who's in rebellion towards all of these things. Now again, Culture can become corrupt. History can be written incorrectly. Science can be faulty. Christianity, we know the history of Christianity. Christians have used Christianity for the wrong reasons. Anything in the world, including ourselves, can be corrupt. But that doesn't mean culture, all of history, science, true accurate science, or the Christian faith, which is in Jesus Christ and the Word, are wrong. It means in the world they can be misused. Now, my point for saying this is when this postmodern age we are in and it's gaining traction, it's like a little fire. You know, it's like trying to start a little. You ever try to start a fire with a little, you know, a little spark? You know, and you, you, you put some little grass in there, and you get, it's like it's it, it's hard work until finally. It starts to burn. You start, then you start putting newspapers and magazines in there. And then pretty soon you put a whole log in there. And it's like if it would happen to break out and catch a hold of a wheat field, whoosh, a dry wheat, it's gone. 
And Christianity is in line. Understand this. This is going to happen fast. It's good. It's like you see this coming. It's in. It's in California. It's in New York. It's in Congress. It's in here. It's in. It's like it's ridiculous. It's like yeah, but they're doing this, and they're adding newspapers to it. Yeah, actually, yeah, newspapers, media, but they're adding to it, and that, that flame is burning. And when it gets a hold of Christianity, not just this this guy over here who's 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 you know speaking against this, or this guy over here who said something culturally inappropriate here. It's like. The whole, when it catches hold, this whole thing, is, I mean, you're going to wake up one day. You're going to go to bed one night and find, and the next day you're going to wake up, and all of a sudden it's like, it's a, like churches are on fire. I mean, just like, what, what happened? Again, that's not a prophecy that you're going to go to sleep one night and wake up. But it's good. I think it's got the potential of when it starts burning, it's gone. And you're going to see a division like you've never seen before because people that don't understand. They're, they're choosing between fake Christ and true Christ. And the only way you're going to find this is in the Word of God. Well, you could find it in nature. You could find it in... I mean, God's not limited. But the typical way is that's why He gave us the Word. And the Word is going to... It's telling us right now. Not me. Not a prophet. The Word is laying down right here. You see... The elite oppressing the middle class. You're going to see the the, the postmodern age. We got other things coming. That when this starts taking place, the word tells us it's coming. It can come at least, and that God may not come to your rescue and and sweep you up and take you into heaven. That you may end up dying. You may die. You may be persecuted. Uh, the, the victory's in the end. The victory is not necessarily in your life. Well, no, not even necessarily. You may experience the goodness of God in your life like anybody, but the victory will not take place until the end. So if you understand this, you can die. You can face persecution knowing, I really wasn't expecting, I was hoping to make it without being persecuted, but if you read the text of Scripture, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Paul, Peter, uh, the book of Revelation, the Jews, they, they always faced opposition. If that doesn't make sense to you, then this is going to make sense to you. This fate, they're going to have a lot, not a lot, they're going to have almost everything that the Bible's got is going to line up over here. And people are going to very easily be able to watch you burn and come over here and join this group over here and go, well, yeah, they, they, they must have been racist. They must have been, you know, they must have been something. And they're going to blame you for this. As, they, as the groups come over here and this mounts. And then, of course, that's over. And so, here's what postmodern is. This is right out of the Titanic Faith book. Um, after modern, or pre modern, modern, and postmodern, this is uh, the, the authority now is the individual. Pre modern, the authority was God, or a God, or some divine source. That gave way in the 1500s to uh, science or institutions that could examine and demonstrate scientifically through, through test and experimentation repeated, this is testable. That's why it became questionable. You can't prove God exists, you know, with, here we're going to do a test right here. God, if you're here, say hello. Hello. There it is. We go to another classroom and we're going to do a test see if there's God. God, if you're here, say hello. Hello. And we, we couldn't do that test. I mean, it's like there's no test. You could do certain things and we put this here, put that here, heat it up like this, this happens. You couldn't prove. Well, we'll pray. God, will you heal this person? He did. God, will you heal this person? He didn't. It's like you, you couldn't put God in some kind of a test. Now, God explains test there, and he says, test me. And there's certain things that we can find that we can prove there's a God, but not in the scientific method. Again, that's another whole conversation. Institutions began to use science and their authority, if it be universities, uh, if it be uh, governments, began to use that power and abuse people. Just like in the pre-modern age, religion abused and used people. Then all of a sudden, the science world, the institution, whoever had the knowledge, whoever had the power, could have the money. And also now, with all the world wars, uh, the totalitarian, totalitarian states 
if it be Russia, if it be uh, uh, Nazis. 1948 is basically, basically the breaking point for modern age. And that's the, and I've got it written right down here. The postmodern age began, of course, we didn't feel the effect of it because, you know, we're, we're, we're part of culture. We've got to be worked into it. Uh, but it began in 1945, if you want to set a general date on it. Because when they saw the, the nations collapsing and the, nation, the Christian nations fighting each other, they realized there's no truth here either. We don't know what to do. And it, here it is. Postmodernism believes it is impossible to correctly dis to describe reality. Now that's convenient. We can't describe reality, which means right here, everything I say as a Bible teacher, it, it's your opinion. It's what you think, and we don't have to pay attention to it. Uh, truth may exist, but we cannot know it. The very fact I'm claiming we know the truth would mean I'm lying and I'm oppressive. We cannot recognize, find, or even judge truth. Now, I'm saying the Bible is the truth. There is a God. Jesus is the Savior. You can't say that. The very fact you're saying that means you're saying everyone else is wrong. No room for that. I hear some people that were involved, some, some uh, inventions that, that are things that took place. Israel becoming a nation, invention of the transistor that made radios possible, the television comes in the home, Cuban Missile Crisis that freaked everyone out. Uh, hell, oh man, 1964. Can you believe this? The Berkeley free speech movement on college campuses. Okay, we'll give you free speech. Well, now we're, we're whatever, 50 years later, that's completely flipped on us. Now the free speech movement is saying, shut up, we are in control now. I mean, there's, there's no, I mean, that is, if you lived in the 60s and you remember this, and I remember the, the free, I remember co college campuses having riots and, and the protests of wanting to speak things that were stupid. And they wanted, and it's like, okay, okay, okay. You, you, truth wins. In the end, truth wins. And, I, and, and we believe that. So you can go ahead, you preach your true Christ, we'll see what happens. You preach your fake Christ, see what happens. I'm up for this challenge every day. That's what the Generation Word Ministry is based on. I'm going to teach the Word of God and watch it work. And you can teach your stupid fake Christianity and watch it work and just watch lives spiral out of control. I've watched it for 40 years. It's like, this builds a foundation in the person's life. Even if they have to go to death, they're ready to go. They're ready to face the world the best it's got to offer as far as oppression. These people, the minute a paycheck is laid, oh, they, they can't handle this. It's like, we thought we were gonna have every, it's like, I'm not afraid of this. The only way to stop this you know what it is. How do you stop this? Oppression. Thus the free speech movement. 1964, Berkeley free speech movement. We want free speech. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> Go ahead. You make your speech. Let's have a debate. And they can't win. They've got to manipulate. They've got to oppress. They've got to somehow stack the deck. And now that the deck has been stacked, we've been over here, in a sense, playing the, you know, we trust the truth. And now they're going to shut down the truth. The truth is going to win in the end. But at this point in culture, in our culture at this point, we may not see the victory. You may have to know the victory in order to endure. Uh, it goes through, then of course it ends up with uh, uh, personal computers and mass market 1980s. That, now, I mean, we're talking wildfire now. Okay, all truth is limited, approximate, it's evolving. No theory can ever be proven true. We can only prove a theory to be false. Physical reality is not deterministic. Get that physical reality. You can test it and you can see it, but it may not really be what's there. For example, sexual orientation. It's a boy. Not necessary. Let's ask it. What? Now it's going. I mean, it, it's all. It all makes sense. This all. I mean, we've seen this coming. Now some are going to mock the very fact, or mock. They're going to become irate. The very fact is like you're saying gender is biological. It's scientific. It's like I mean, in the modern age it is. In the pre-modern age it is. But now in the post-modern age is. We've got a different 
way of evaluating truth. So uh, I will agree, in the postmodern age, gender is determined in some other way. Now, it's not reality, it's not right, it's not truth, but yeah, I understand. You don't know reality, you don't trust science, you're going to do it a different way. So to adapt, you don't have to necessarily agree with it, but you've got to understand, they're making it up. Well, that's not right. Well, in the postmodern age, it is right. Well, I thought you said you're against it, but I am against it. It's not right. But that's the way the decisions are going to be made. Scientific concepts are mental cons constructs. Hear that? They're, they're mental constructs. It is extreme skepticism in this age. There's more people. Uh, they're, the ways of going about these is going to be deconstruction. They've got to deconstruct everything. They're going to be anti-authority because authority is what tells them what is reality. And no authority is going to be left standing. The only authority that's going to be left standing is the elite, those who are controlling the power because they've got to have the, the oppression, the violence to secure themselves. Because if nothing is, is absolute, if there's no authority, these elites have no authority. Right, so take them down. Good luck. They've got all the power because what still exists is reality. Power, oppression, position. And it's like if, if nothing was real, then these elites could be taken down. We just disagree and you walk away from them. Like, you, like a two-year-old walks away from their parent. But you can't walk away from the elite because they've got all the power. So they're pushing this junk, but they themselves know. They have to know. Uh, it's deconstruction, anti-authority, and post-structuralism. Uh, here's their, one of their quotes. The only absolute truth is that there is no absolute truth. Uh, this is scary right here. I'm the, going to the second column. I, again, I'm just reading this. This is just right out of the, the Titanic Faith book. And again, I didn't come up with this. Um, Postmodern is open to spiritual reality. They're going to reject science, but they're going to discover, not just on their heart on the inside, they're going to discover that there are some spiritual truths, some spiritual beings. And they're, going to, they're, uh, they're, they're open to spiritual reality, recognize humans are flawed, understand the authentic need for relationships and the power of a community. Um, so I would, I mean, definitely be looking for spiritual advances in this elite. The elites are soon going to hook up with the spirituals. Spirituals. If you want to call them angels, demons, aliens, they're going to find something uh, spiritual beyond their reality, and it's going to help support their agenda. Um, and here's some key words. Words like mystery, tolerance, journey, uh, non-judgmental, let's have a conversation. I, I, can't, I can just imagine postmodern churches not having sermons or Bible class, but having conversations. Uh, they're not, they don't have teachers, they have facilitators, uh, which is, that's nice. Uh, so it, it's the spiritual gift of a facilitator. Uh, uh, there's a place for all that, I'm sure, you know. Uh, we got more things here to look at. But the point there is when this, understand, this is coming. It's been coming since 1945. It's gaining strength. You can actually see it in practice. The flames are now taking hold. They're blowing, trying to start, start a spark in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s. Even the free speech movement was part of get this thing rolling. And now they've got enough flame that the free speech movement can say, we don't believe in free speech anymore. We believe in us, you shut up. It's like, I mean, you, do, you, do you see that? I mean, you guys know this, you've experienced this, you've seen it go from free speech to those who were given free speech have now said, shut up, we don't let you talk, they're controlling. And so this is, this is there's all, this is a flame, we're not trying to start this. When this starts burning, when this gets a hold of the dry wheat field of Christianity, it's going, to, it's going to sweep it away. I'm not saying something negative about Christianity or Jesus Christ or the truth. I'm saying in the time, in the temporal world, it's going to sweep it away. Under, it's, it's not going to damage 
It's not going to damage your faith. And Peter talks about that. It's going to damage, uh, it's going to make people make a decision. Okay, uh, let's go to these verses very quickly. Habakkuk chapter 3. We bumped into this a couple weeks ago on, uh, on, on Monday night. Habakkuk chapter 3. This is an example of when, when the Babylonians, Habakkuk saw the Babylonians coming. For example, we can say, or I'm saying, I'm, I may be wrong, I may be wrong. I'm saying we see the pre-modern coming. We see the elites coming. And they're bringing oppression. Help God, help, help us God. Habakkuk says, I see the Babylonians coming. God, help, God, help. And God says, no, 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 this is, this is, this is, I, I'm the one I'm calling them. I'm, I'm bringing them. It's like, what? God knows these, the pre-modern are coming. He knows they're coming. They're coming like the Babylonians are coming. The pre-moderns are coming in judgment. They're, they're coming. It's like it's time. The judgment begins with the house of the Lord. The judgment. It's like the pre, we're gonna bring this. Like yeah, because we're gonna sift before we judge the pre-moderns. We're gonna judge the believer. We're gonna use it to sift and test the believer. Before the Babylonians were judged, who was judged? Judah. It's like why are you judging the the, the Judah with the wicked? Because these, this is the house of God. When I'm done judging Judah and Babylon passes on through, I'll take the Babylonians out. The pre-moderns are coming. They're going to judge those who say, we're Christians. The house of God is going to be tested with this garbage. It's like, how in the world is God? It's because we're going to find out. And the Christians are going to stand. Judah went through the captivity. They came back and they're still alive today. It's still surviving as they Christians, you will pass through the fire and not be burned. Not like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego necessarily, but you will pass through the fire and you will come out in victory. Pre-modern are going to face the wrath of God in time and ultimately in eternity. Here we go. Habakkuk's got the trouble with this when he sees this, and so he writes in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 16. He says, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. In other words, if you understood the Babylonians and what they were capable of doing and what they had done, including what you see on the map right here, destroying Nineveh in 612, and now they're coming for Judah, uh, we're reading Nahum. It, it, is he, he's quaking. He's here. If you understood, if you understood pre-moderns, and you understood the potential of the elites and what they've got planned, and I do not. I don't have any inside information. I'm just looking at this from what I see and what I'm around and what the Bible says. If, if you understood this, your response to what I'm trying to explain would be like this. Your heart pounding, your lips quivering, decay creeping into your bones, your legs trembling, and, 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 and just like, oh my God, this is not going to be good. This is all going down. And I'm going with it. <clears throat> and Habakkuk, this is a prophet. This is not like a false prophet. This is not a guy with bad doctrine. This is a guy who, who prophesied the Babylonians are coming, turned to God and says, you're going to stop this, right? And God says, no, no, no. This is my plan. It's like, you're kidding. They're going to... And he, he realized that this was going to happen to Judah, and he's, he's physically scared of what's going to take place. And yet, after he realized it, he goes, <clears throat> he says, Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. I will wait for this day. And this day for us is going to be the day the Lord returns. He says, I will wait for that day. Though the fig does not mean what, meanwhile, I'm waiting for eschatology. Though, and now in temporal world, though the fig tree does not bud and there is no grapes in the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. And he's not talking about running on the heights away from the Babylonians. He's talking about in another dimension, his faith, his, his deliverance in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, especially eschatologically. Now we got another verse, uh, Daniel. I don't need to read these. Uh, but Daniel 7, 21, 7, 25, and 8, 24 all say the saints are given over to 
if it's Antiochus Epiphanes, if it's the Antichrist, if it's the little horn. And that's where I gave you that verse uh, of Revelation, what was it, 13, 7. It says, uh, then the beast was permitted to wage war against the saints and to overpower them, and power was given to him over all the nations. In other words, you've got three examples. You've got uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, you've got the little horn, You've got the beast, you've got the Antichrist, and somehow there's some overlap, but examples of all of those being given power directly over the saints to crush them and to take them to a place of purity. And they've got to get to that place where they're going to look as Habakkuk did. It's like, you're scared, but my strength is in the Lord. Again, I'm telling you Bible stories. I'm telling you this is the doctrine. I'm not telling you this is what Galen is doing. This is what I'm saying Galen needs to get ready to do. Uh, i got to read this verse. I, I'd love to read this to you. I, I, I need Tony's clock flashing up in front of me. Okay. Jeremiah 44, verse 15. Now just this, i got to show you this to you, and then I'll quit. You need to read 2 Peter 3. Uh, Jeremiah 44. There, I just gave you a homework assignment. How'd that work out? Jeremiah 33. Or excuse me, Jeremiah 44. The background for this, and this is... This is, this, you need to see this because it's one of those things where you need to know it's coming. You need to know it's coming. Not only is persecution coming, and the elites are coming to drive the middle class down, when it's all said and done and it doesn't work out, it's going to be your fault. Jeremiah 44. What is taking place right here is Jeremiah has been prophesying since, let's, we can say, 640. He's been prophesying since 640. We go back here into Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah 640 to 609, uh, or Jer Josiah, Jer Jeremiah is uh, prophesying during 630 to 609, same time period, during that time, up to 586, when Jerusalem falls. He's been saying, and let's just change this to 630 to be safe, since 630 to 586, he's been saying the Babylonians are coming, he's going to burn, the, they're going to burn this place down, submit to Nebuchadnezzar. And the people said, no, 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 we're not going to do this, God will deliver us, and all of whatever, they're, and they're still living wickedly. Now, it's been burnt, everything's burnt, uh, a bunch of them taken captive. The first, second, third captivity. Jeremiah was released from the chains and sent back with the, basically sent back with the poor people. The poor people weren't taken. Some of them were left behind. Jeremiah could stay where he could go to Babylon or he could go with the people and he chose to stay with the people. Nebuchadnezzar let him choose. And he was, his chains were taken off and he was chosen. Many of the poor people and the people that weren't needed were, were, were left in Jerusalem. Now what takes place is they're afraid that Nebuchadnezzar is going to come back and attack them again. Now the thing is, they don't have a city. They don't have any walls. They don't have a temple. There's no gold left. There's not, they're nothing. They're, they're nothing. They're street people now, trying to live in huts and trying to just get, their, you know, get some crops together. And Dear Jeremiah says, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is not coming back. Well, we're afraid of him. Don't be afraid. They say, okay, what should we do? Ask God. We, we think we should go to Egypt. We should go to Egypt and run from Nebuchadnezzar. They says, Jeremiah, we're sorry we did not listen. Now watch this. We're sorry we did not listen to you. We were wrong. But if you'll inquire of the Lord, we'll listen this time. Okay? I think, he, I think he goes and he asks for three days. Give me three days or something. And he comes back and he says, God says, no. Do not go to Egypt. Stay here in the land. Nebuchadnezzar's not coming back and I'll be with you. Jeremiah, you're lying to us again. Just like you did for 40 years. You kept deceiving us. You deceived us. We're not, we're going to go to Egypt. So they take Jeremiah and they drag him to Egypt and now the people are in Egypt. Did you see what they just did? Now they're in Egypt. And now, here, here, AJ, I'm going to read that. i got 15 verses. I'm going to read it to you, and then I'm going to quit, if, if that's possible. 15, chapter 44, verse 15. Now they're in Egypt. Then all the men who knew that their wives were burning incense to other gods, along with all the women who were present, a large assembly. These are Jews in Egypt with Jeremiah, arguing with him. And all the people living in lower and upper Egypt said to Jeremiah, we will not listen to the message you have spoken to us in the name of Yahweh. Now that's not here. That's not here when they're still in Israel after the burning of Jerusalem. That's after they've rejected this, they've rejected this, 
And now they're in Egypt and he's telling them again another message. Trying to guide their lives. And now they're saying no. So they say no, no. And now they're in Egypt. Jeremiah, you're kidding. You think we're going to listen to you? We will certainly do everything we said we would. We will burn incense to the queen of heaven as we pour out drink offerings to her just as we did, we and our fathers, our kings, and our officials did in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Now, to the, the people in the know, or to the rational person, God brought judgment on them because they're offering sacrifices to pagan gods in the streets and pouring out drink offerings. Now they say no to uh, Jeremiah, and now they're in Egypt and they're still doing it. And Jeremiah says, you need to stop. They says, no, we're going to keep doing exactly what our forefathers taught us to do. We're going to continue with our traditions. At that time, when we used to, when we used to, back up in here, we, when we used to do this, at that time we had plenty of food and were well off and suffered no harm. But ever since we stopped burning incense to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have had nothing and we have been perishing by the sword and famine. Now when did they stop offering sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven? It was right about here when Josiah and Jeremiah brought in reform. And God was telling them, We're gonna, I'm going to destroy this, this place. The prophecy was given. They found the book of law and they said they tried to clean it up. Now Josiah tried. Jeremiah tried, but the people never changed. And so they were forced to quit. They were forced to quit offering, but their hearts stayed with it the whole time. And now they're in Egypt and they say, we know the problem. We know what happened. When we were offering burnt sacrifices and, and drink offerings to the Queen of Heaven and the pagan gods, everything was fine. People are going to be able to go back and say, in the 80s and the 90s, when all the whatever before okay here here it is before Trump everything was fine everything was fine and then Trump came and that's when it all or whatever and I'm using Trump as an example my message is not Trump but I'm saying they're going to find something and it's going to be the Christians and I watch this the women added now that's the men that was the men talking now their wives we, when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did not our husbands know that we were making cakes like her image and pouring out drink offerings to her? Then Jeremiah said to the people, both men and women who were answering him, did not the Lord remember and think about the incense burned in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem by your, you and your fathers, your kings and your officials and the people of the land, when the Lord could no longer endure your wicked actions and detestable things you did? Your land became an object of cursing and desolate waste without inhabitants as it is today. Because you have burnt incense and have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed him or followed his law or his decrees or his stipulations, his, this, this disaster has come upon you and as you now see. Then Jeremiah said to the people, including the women, Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah in Egypt. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. You and your wives have, have shown by your actions what you promised when you said, We will certainly carry out our vows we made to burn incense and pour out drink offerings to the Queen of Heaven. Go ahead then. Do what you promised. Keep your vows. But hear the word of the Lord, all you Jews living in Egypt. I swear by my great name, says the Lord, that no one from Judah living anywhere in Egypt will ever again invoke my name or swear, as surely as the sovereign Yahweh lives. For I am watching over them for harm, not for good. The Jews in Egypt will perish by the sword and famine until they are destroyed. Those who escape the sword will return to the land of Judah to, from Egypt will be very few. Then the whole remnant of Judah who came to live in Egypt will know whose word will stand, mine or theirs. This will be the sign to you that I, that, that I will punish you in this place, declares the Lord. Watch this. So that you will know that my threats of harm against you will surely stand. This is what the Lord says. I am going to hand Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, over to his enemies who seek his life. Just as I handed Zedekiah, king of Judah, over to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the enemy who is seeking his life, and he's now going to hand over uh, the, the Pharaoh. In other words, guess where Nebuchadnezzar's next stop is? Egypt. And the people that endured the destruction and the, and the siege of, of Nebuchadnezzar in Jerusalem 
fled to Egypt just in time to get there for the siege of Egypt. And they lived through the whole nightmare all over again. If they would have stayed here, they would have been fine. Now again, the whole point, they, they have no ability to take responsibility. And Jeremiah, and again, I was going to read the 2 Peter chapter 3. It tells you what you need to do. You need to keep doing what is right. You need to keep doing what is right. And, and the world is going to come against you. And when you do what is right, and when you speak in the name of the Lord, when you, when you encourage people, they are going to come against you. It, it's the way it works. It's the way it works. So it's like, is that encouraging? And the, the encouraging is you make your choice and get ready to speak the Word of God, live righteously in a world that is not going to convert. They're not going to come around. It's like, well, there's always hope. There's always hope. But do you see the biblical examples? It's like, there's, there's a point of no return, and we may be there. Uh, okay, I'm going to pray and leave with that happy note. Well, happy note is, stay true to God. We win in the end, but you may have to actually live the Christian life. Father, we do thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. We ask that we would find strength, that we'd find encouragement, we'd find direction. But Father, mostly that we would find a, a, a way of living a life that is pleasing to you without being intimidated or overcome or overrun by the world. Father, we do ask that we would again stand firm and, and, and be prepared for things that maybe we don't even understand we're talking about. Father, we do again ask you for your strength and your revelation to appear in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your patience.